Hi, this is the Chappiness Guy. Welcome to today's episode of Vestibular Talks. Today's special guest is Amy. Amy is a young stroke survivor. Yes, a stroke. Amy is here with us today to share her story of surviving, recovery, and how she takes a positive spin to his, her condition and her situation. She's also here with us to spread hope within the community that recovery and healing is possible. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy the episode, guys. Find your chaplains. Right, Amy, we're live. So how are you today? I'm not too bad. How are you going today? Great. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us on this episode of Vestibular Talks. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Not a problem. I'm happy to be here. Amy, do you mind telling us a little bit about who you are? Sure. I'm um, a 36-year-old mother of two. I have an eight and a five-year-old um, well, children. Um, and 15 months ago, my life was interrupted through um, having a stroke. So basically an artery at the back of my neck dissected um, and caused a stroke on my cerebellum. So as a result of that, um, I've been in a 15 month and um, it'll keep going and going recovery ever since. So. Um, that, is, uh, that is very interesting. It's, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry you had to experience such a traumatic event because a stroke is a, is a major life-changing event in, in mm. people's lives. Um, you're fairly young, so did, did, uh, did you ever have any signs or any idea that this was going to happen to you? Um, looking back and how I was going about life, I certainly have questions around whether I was overexerting myself. So. Um, I have always been into fitness from a very young age. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess together with being a mother, I was working a pretty much full-time job um, and the job was stressful. So it wasn't, it was like in um, quite high up in finance. Um, I was exercising every morning or pretty much every, every morning at 6 a.m. So before the kids would wake up, I'd go off and do my exercise. Um, and you know, it wasn't just a walk along the beach. It was lifting weights and throwing balls around and um, really flogging my body um, and getting the most out of those, you know, 45 minutes I was out there. Um, and I guess I would never say no to anything. So, you know, I wanted my kids to be involved in all the extracurricular activities there was. So we'd run around trying to fit them into swimming, into cricket, into football, into gymnastics. Um, and there was just no downtime in my life. Um, if there was downtime, I didn't like it. Um, so I would find a way to fill that downtime with something something else, whether it was connection or moving or adding something else to the schedule. Um, so yeah, looking back, this probably the six months before stroke, I was um, experiencing like extreme tiredness after I was exercising. It could be completely unrelated, but um, I'd often find if I did a big hour workout on a Saturday morning, I'd have to have a nap in the afternoon on the Saturday. Um, so that's really the only sign, if, and that's, you know, it's probably completely um, unrelated to the stroke, but that's probably the only thing that was a bit different. Okay, something that uh, seems to be, a, a, I would say, like a pattern for a, a few people that I've interviewed is that many of us that have come down with a with like you like you for example with a stroke, me with uh, with, uh, chronic vestibular migraines, people with uh, other with MS for example, they something that we have in common is that we were high performance and high achievers. Like we, we were mm -hmm. always busy, go go go, uh, had yeah. very successful jobs, very successful careers. I myself, I'm a parent as well. I have a son. He's 14 years old. And uh, so we, I was always busy, go, go, go. And like you said, no real downtime. So take us back, please, Amy, to when the stroke first happened. What what were the symptoms? Uh, how do you react to it? What happened? 
Um, sure. So it was it was a weekend. Um, on the Saturday, my cousin and I had won some tickets to go to the horse racing, um, just close to home. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to go. I was coming up with all the reasons to not go because I was so busy. Um, but she talked me into it and so off we went and it was a bit of a girl's day out. They had um, all the novelty things like tarot reading and they did your hair and makeup. If it got, um, you know, if it got messy, they'd touch it up for you. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was very glamorous and it was beautiful. It was a lot of fun. Um, so then I woke up Sunday morning feeling a bit worse for wear. Um, just sort of brushed it off, um, got through Sunday. And Sunday night, I thought I'll do, an, do a workout to redeem myself for the big day I had the day before. Um, however, during that workout, um, I believe something happened. And that's it's when I believe the tear happened in my vertebral artery. So um, it was nothing unusual. It was nothing different to what I'd normally do. Um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with a burpee. You, you jump up and you touch the ground, you get back up again. Just a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but from what I've learned, it doesn't take much to tear an artery. You can basically doing it looking at looking at the roof. So um, I did that ex that exercise, and a little bit later on that night, I felt like I could see black spots out of my eyes. Um, I thought I just need to go to sleep and wake up tomorrow, and everything will be okay. So went to bed, and then the next day woke up with an incredibly sore neck down the left side. Um, I drove into work. You know, just brushed it all off because you don't think anything serious is happening at the age of 35. Um, no. And spent the day at work. I was actually training someone because I'd recently been promoted. So this person was doing my old role. So I'd spent the day with someone else um, and just feeling slightly off. So I thought maybe one of the kids has passed on a virus and I'm coming down with a cold or something like that. Um, but about 3.30 p.m., I was walking back with this colleague and I had a cup of tea in my hand. And as I walked towards the office, I looked at my feet. And when I looked up, the room did a spin. And I thought, oh, that was a bit trippy. What was that? So I quickly got into the office um, and went to sit down on the chair. And as I sat down, my whole left side um, had this force, like it was being pulled to the side to the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and I physically had to put my left hand down to push against the desk to keep myself up. So, um, yeah, I knew at that point this isn't this isn't a cold. Um, and I said to my colleague, I'm just going to lay on the floor, put my feet up. I think I've got low blood pressure or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so about 30 minutes later, I still wasn't feeling that that hot. Um, and the colleague offered to drive me home. So I took him up on that um, and got home and pretty much went to bed after taking some ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then it was about, oh, I'm going to say about three hours later, I woke up um, in bed and looked at the TV that was on and something just wasn't right. And then all of a sudden I felt like I was on a roller coaster, just like I was on a theme park ride. Um, I, you know, went to sit up. I couldn't move. I basically couldn't move without feeling like I was going to um, throw up. Yes. So I called my husband in. I said, yeah, I'm getting worse. Something's clearly not right here. Um, I think we should go to hospital. And, you know, he said, get out of bed and get in the car and we'll go. I said, no, I can't move. Um, and it was more, it was not that I physically couldn't move. So I wasn't there was no paralysis as such, but it was any little slight movement of my head made the roller coaster ride more intense. So he called the ambulance, my mum came over and off we went to the hospital. This is very interesting because um, I can honestly say that I, I've never had a stroke, but I can honestly say that I relate to your experience in the sense that vestibular migraines often start like that. You, you have a sensation that Either the room is spinning or you are like off balance and being pulled to one side like you're, gonna, you're about to fall. Mm -hmm. So your balance is way off as well as visual disturbances like you feel you, like your eyes can focus on, on a specific sure. point. And, uh, and, and the fact that you were feeling like just something wasn't quite right. So many, many uh, vestibular migraine people that, that suffer from the condition, uh, they often 
get scared and they go and get an MRI done uh, because they, they think, oh, I'm having a stroke because the symptoms mm. are way too much alike. So, uh, so Amy, walk us through that. When you got to the hospital, sure. did, they, did they immediately identify what was happening or they had to do a lot of tests? No, absolutely not. Um, the ambulance officers were 100% sure it was vertigo. So they even debated, should we or shouldn't we take you into hospital? Um, where I live, there's quite often, I'm not sure if it's the same in Canada, but ambulance officers are very much in demand. So once you yes. get to hospital, huge queues. Um, so I guess they're a little bit more careful these days about assessing who needs to go um, just for that reason. So anyway, they decided just the way I presented that I should be seen by someone. Um, but yeah, they, were, they started a, a treatment for um, vomiting because I couldn't stop throwing up. Um, but that had just had no effect whatsoever. Um, I remember being wheeled into the hospital and the talk that went on around me um, and they're just like, you're presenting as vertigo. It's got vertigo written all over it. And I just remember thinking, okay, well, vertigo sucks. Like yeah. if this is vertigo, wow, okay. Um, but yeah, as the night went on, um, you know, I continued to throw up. I couldn't move my head. Um, I was completely with it. I knew what people were saying, but I wasn't talking much. Um, and I was just trying to keep really still to prevent throwing up. Mm -hmm. It's not one of my favourite pastimes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I spent the night there under the fluorescent lights. Now, my husband was sitting at the end of the bed most of the night. When I opened my eyes, it was like he was flipped 90 degrees. So he was actually coming off the wall. Um, and I had to really concentrate to and look at the curtain railing to figure out, no, that way's up. And so, yeah, it, it was horrendous. Um, and if I closed my eyes, it was this bright, bright yellow light, almost like a strobing um, effect going on. So it wasn't pleasant with my eyes closed and it wasn't pleasant with my eyes open. So it was really tough. Um, I then started hearing conversations. It must have been as morning was getting closer. Um, around getting put on a neuro ward. Um, and I actually work in hospitals, so I'm across hospital speak. And I was thinking neuro, that doesn't sound great. Um, and then I heard them saying suspected meningitis, which um, that terrified me probably more than yeah. the thought of a neuro ward. Um, and so the doctor, you know, the nurse or the doctor would come over and I'm like, do I have meningitis? And they're like, oh, probably only one symptom. We're looking at something else now. So the next minute, um, the physician came on and he said, we're going to send you for a CT scan. I thought, OK, you know, by this point, I think I'd sort of lost all ability to really know what was going on around me. And um, yeah, they wheeled me into this CT, trying to get me onto the board. That was um, quite horrendous as well, because any little movement I would just throw up, but there was nothing left to throw up. So it was just. Yeah, I would not wish it upon my worst enemy. Not that I have any enemies, but um, yeah. just yeah. just such a bad night. And um, the CT scan showed up nothing. So they weren't convinced. Um, luckily, I had doctors that weren't convinced um, and they ordered the next one up, which was the MRI. So between the CT and the MRI, I was put on a hospital ward. So they admitted me into a medical ward. Um, and yeah, but I think it was a bit later on that day I went for the MRI which was when the tear in the artery showed up and the stroke showed up. That is uh, wow and, uh, I'm sorry because the, the, the symptoms are so so similar to to what I mean it's weird Amy the fact that you okay when I came down with these vestibular migraines I've never had the world till 90 degrees but it was 45 degrees to the right and I would mm. tell my doctor I'm like the world is tilted and he's like, how is that possible? And I'm like, I don't know. So I can't even imagine how the sensation of fear that you probably experience because you're seeing your husband tilted to the side. But in your mind, you're like, this this doesn't make sense. This, this just cannot happen. So you're probably having a conflict of like, what is happening to me versus the, the reality that you're seeing at the moment. How was your husband handling it? Was, was he OK? Was he nervous? Was he scared? Um. He's a pretty cool, calm, collected kind of person that doesn't show a lot of emotion. Um, 
And at this point, you know, when we first, before we went off to hospital, he thought, you've got food poisoning from your day at the races. You must have eaten something, you know, that was that was bad. And I just remember thinking, food poisoning doesn't make this happen. Like, that's that's more of a stump. Like, this was, this was head. Um, he... Yeah, he wasn't panicked. He, I guess, you know, it's that old, um, that old theory when you're going through something, it's, it's bad, but maybe the fear of going through that is worse. So, you know, the fear of, well, it's not my experience, my, what I experienced was pretty bad, but, yeah. um, you know, if you've got, I had a prem daughter and she was in hospital for eight weeks back in 2015. So, going through it you just kind of equip you know you get your fight or flight response happening you go through the process because you have no choice mm. um whereas looking at that situation and you go i could never handle that so i think once you're in a situation i mean he's not the type to flip out and pace the corridors or anything like that you just kind of wait and as time goes by things unravel so yes, just yeah um, i mean he was probably petrified he did take a picture of me at about 11.30 p.m., which I haven't shared with anybody, okay. and I struggle to look at it. Um, I have it in a hidden folder on my phone, and it's just me laying in that hospital bed. But it, to me now, it just looks like a person in a bed. But from the inside and everything that was happening through my eyes and what I was seeing, completely different. So just amazing how <clears throat> those doctors probably looked at me and thought I was so normal. Like she's, I can see why they were saying you're having vertigo. You're just growing up. But yeah, if only for 30 seconds had they experienced what was going on. And memories like inside. that, uh, memories like that as a, for a traumatic event, like you went through uh, a memory, like seeing that picture could easily trigger PTSD because you lived through it. So it, it, just seeing the picture will take your mind back to the moment of, of vulnerability when you were so, so, confused about what was happening. So Amy, what's the recovery process after a stroke? Like what, what do they do? Did they give you medication, exercises? Like what happens? Yeah, so it wasn't until, um, I think they told me about the dissection in my neck and then it wasn't until the next day. So I went in on Monday night and it wasn't until Wednesday morning that the neurologist said the word stroke. Um, and that sort of had my, ears light up because by then I'd stopped throwing up and I was sort of I'd come to and I was like right when am I getting back to work so um when he said stroke I just kind of snapped back what do you mean I had a stroke I thought it was a tear he goes yeah you had a tear and it caused a stroke he was very laid back about it all and I just kind of sat there and thought hmm stroke like I had no idea what a stroke was um I well, don't you know anyone so had a stroke yeah I know one person, but um, it didn't really register and and my brain just fought it. So I was like, oh, no, I didn't have a stroke. I just had this bad experience and no, it wasn't a stroke. Strokes are like when you are paralyzed and like I was grabbing pencils and trying to write and just making sure I could still write things so that when I go back to work, I could still write. And <laughs> um, the in terms of rehab, um, I guess stroke survivors most of the um the focus is around physical therapy okay because you know quite often you're physically impacted and your deficits involve physical limitations so with me um most of my physical impact is through my cerebellum which controls balance and coordination so uh -huh. while i can move my hands and i can walk i can even run um the way I stand and the way the balls of my feet interpret where I am um, can vary each day. So, you know, if I walk along the carpet with no shoes on, it might feel like, you know, I'm walking on or I'm running on concrete. Like it's like it. it so the message sort of goes through my heels up to my cerebellum, which if it's all... Um, like irritable because I've been doing too much. It'll get confused and be like, ah, she's walking again. And then I'll get this weird, uncomfortable sort of feeling because I'm walking on bare feet. But if then I go and put my sneakers on or my runners, whoop, um, it's sort of, uh, it dampens the effect. So, 
you know, how much gel and whatnot's in a pair of Nikes. Um, so I'll start walking and it's like it takes away a bit of the impact. Um, so it's all around how my cerebellum is interpreting where I am on any given day. Um, not so much whether I can pick up a piece of paper, um, which is really challenging because at rehab, they just put me on an exercise bike and put me in a hydrotherapy pool and it all made me feel sick. Like it was the pool I had to literally hold on to the edge because I thought I was going to fall in and like drown and I'm a good swimmer. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at the water made me nauseous. I yeah. thought like I was going to throw up. It was it was awful. Like it was almost worse than the stroke itself. Um, and getting on a bike, any time I sort of got my heart rate above 105 beats per minute, the dizzy feeling would kick in and my brain would go, what's going on? Why is my heart rate up? Why are you sending blood up to the brain? And um, yeah, rehab hasn't been that easy for me because I'm not a typical, um, I don't fit the typical mould of stroke rehab, I don't think. Um, any instances of, of headaches or migraines after the stroke or post the stroke? Uh, yeah. mm, absolutely. Um, the headaches and migraines have eased up now, but uh, within the first six months, I have never had a migraine before the stroke, but I think I had two. Um, and, you know, I talked to the doctors about that. And we sort of, I mean, there's no answer, but I could sort of predict when it may be coming on. And that was my way of dealing with it. So if I, you know, sent stimulation overload, to prevent a migraine happening, I would try and stop and not keep going to let it come on. Um, and headaches, I had like a pressure in my head and almost like I had to wear, um, you know, when you go on a plane, you wear those neck breasts. I felt like I needed to wear one of those 24 seven because my head felt so heavy on my yeah. neck. Um, but that feeling is not there anymore, thankfully. Well, thankfully, yeah. Uh, some yeah. of the other symptoms that I experience or that many people with vestibular conditions experience are uh, movement. So, for example, looking at cars mm -hmm. driving by or a train yes. passing by, yes. it, yep. it, it, it gives you the sensation that you're moving and falling with yep. it, like you're, as well as uh, busy patterns. So if you see like a, a carpet or a curtain that has a bunch of patterns, you kind of feel like, whoa, like, that's too much to look at. Like, do you experience yeah. similar symptoms? Yes, well? exactly that. Um, <laughs> you, you've put it in a really good description and sometimes I can't describe it. Um, you know, when you're driving your car, this morning I was driving and a car next to me was sort of parked on the road, but it started slowly taking off you as I was it? driving. And I'm like, what is that car? What's going on? Am I going backwards? You and feel your mood. I yes. think I'm a bit more sensitive to that than a normal person would be. Yes. Um, it also happens in terms of the patterns. I find black and white the most difficult. So we went to this holiday house in December 2019, uh, 20, 2019. Yeah, just before, just after the stroke had happened, about eight weeks later. And the bathroom had these black and white diamond tiles and checkerboard tiles on the floor. Yeah. And literally walking in there was like, it was, it was vestibular uh, rehab 101. Like that, yeah, just yeah. go in there for five minutes and that's all you need to do. So last year, December 2020, we went to the same holiday house. It was a good sort of um, measuring point because I yeah, remember yeah. hardly even being able to go into that bathroom. But then, then the year just gone, um, I was tolerating, tolerating it a lot better. So it's still not perfect but and more, it still looks more. like it's moving. But um. Yeah, it's definitely improved. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. Amy, um, you mentioned earlier that when you close your eyes, you could see almost like these yellow lights flickering mm. inside of your vision. I don't see yellow, mine are orange. And it's almost like almost when you when you if you look at a light bulb or a lamp for too long and you close your eyes and you see like the, the after effect. My eyes mm. are like that all the time. Did that ever is up for you? Because I, I hopefully that is up for me. Do you mean like a glare? Kind, kind of like when you close your eyes, it's almost like it's bright, like it, it doesn't get dark. It, it's it's almost like bright in the, even mm. when your eyes close. I get sometimes if I've been in the sun for too long and yeah. then I go home into like a normal, like into, a, you know, into a house, I can find I have a lasting glare, but that's with my eyes open. Um, when I close my eyes, I'm just testing. It's not abnormally bright. Um, but I say that night when I experienced all that bright light, 
Mm -hmm. I'd say that was like the, the stairway, you know, when they say the bright lights come for you when you're dying. Yeah. To me, that was you have like a that. spotlight on you, yeah. That was like the, I've never seen anything like it, and the um, it was coupled with I don't know if you call it hallucinations, but like memories that were so far buried in my subconscious, I couldn't tell you what they were now, but just the thoughts that went through my head that night as well, like flashing, and it's they you know they, when they talk about just before you die, it's, um. You have like what they say you have you have the memories and the bright lights and i'm sure it was I'm, I'm, yeah uh, amy since you were very active very athletic post recovery were you able to resume doing uh, exercises and other activities like that or you kind of ease it up on that a little bit uh no i can't do that um <laughs> and that was one of the hardest things yeah. was after the stroke who am i because before stroke, I was a finance manager. I was a busy mom. I was, um, <clears throat> you know, super, super fit, part of a fitness group. And even though I'm still a busy mom, but I'm not a finance manager now. I'm not part of that fitness group now, even though I still know them all. Um, so it was, I really struggled with who, what do I do? Like, who am I? What am I going to be? Um, and I'm a lot, you know, I'm in a better place with all that these days. But um, yeah. Any time my heart rate went up, um, I would feel dizzy, like I was sort of spinning. Um, and then, I, then I'd get anxious and think I was going to have another stroke. So it was kind of like a whirlwind and then you go into a tunnel of doom. And um, it was just best not to exercise at all because it would bring on, you know, anxiety and yeah. whatnot. However, um, these days, I reckon it was when I hit about... Uh, say 12 months, um, I started up my walking and I thought maybe if I just try for 10 minutes at a time um, and then stop as soon as the feeling comes. So I got myself a watch that tracks my heart rate and yeah. um, I'm very wary of when what it can get up to now um, mm -hmm. with that, before that feeling comes about. And yeah, I've come along leaps and bounds. So I started walking, I think six minutes, got to 10 minutes, um, and then I'd get into 14 and 18 minutes before the dizzy feeling would kick in. Um, and then as time goes by, I wouldn't freak out as much when the dizzy feeling did kick in. I'd be like, there it is. I felt it before. Go home. You, you've done 18 minutes. Well done. Um, instead of, oh, my God, am I going to make a scene? I'm in public. I'm going to have another stroke. It, I've sort of learnt how to manage the symptoms. Um, yeah. And I've even started jogging a little bit now. Oh, so, nice. And it's... It, it's my mentality in that, you know, I see people on Instagram that have had strokes jogging. So I'm like, I know you can get there. I know you yeah. can. I see people doing it and it and it gives me hope. So um, I just started late last year. I'm like, just, just try and run for 30 seconds. So a slow jog, 30 seconds. Yeah, I did it. It didn't feel good. It feels like my yeah. brain's wobbling in my head and like I need a shock absorber all around my brain so that, it, you know, it's yeah. not a nice feeling, but. I read somewhere, lean back as you do it so that you don't oh. feel like you're going to fall forward okay. um, to help with the balance. And yeah, now I think at last my personal best is 14 minutes. So nice. 14 minutes nonstop jogging. That's, that's really good. So yeah, that, kudos on that. Amy, the, the dizziness feeling, it often goes side by side with the, it triggers the sympathetic reaction in your brain. So it triggers the fly, fight or freeze. So Sure. Often the DC feeling creates anxiety, making you very yeah. like thinking, shoot, something's gonna happen, something bad's gonna happen. Yeah. Your heart rate starts to increase, you feel like you're gonna fall. Have you found anything? Uh, I don't know, a lot of people do yoga, meditation, a lot of people do humming, like, mm, like have you found mm -hmm. anything to help you soothe that sensation of like of fight or flight? Um, I've tried a lot and I think there's just no no one size fits all to this, but um, I've downloaded a couple of different apps, which I find quite helpful. Um, Calm is one of them, and yep. Smiling Mind is another one. I don't I think that might be Australian. Um, and I've also learned I I was go going to a psychologist when I first had my stroke because um, that formed part of the rehab as well, and she 
recognize that I just run on this adrenaline and that's just but that's just how I've always been I'm you know I'm not happy unless I'm busy so she's like you need to learn to really calm your body down like learn how to rest it because it's um if you can get into that state it's like as good as having a sleep she was saying so she sort of taught me through um hypnotize like hypnotizing almost yeah. Yeah. how to really get into um a relaxed state and I'm pretty good at doing that myself now um nice. If I sense myself sort of coming up to the point where, no, you're, you're amped, you need to calm down because the dizziness kicks in if I get yeah. amped, I'll um, go and lay on the couch and put on like a six, ten-minute meditation and just listen to it and breathe. And I think breathing's a big thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And it's amazing how it can bring you back and you go, okay, let's just drop all those eight things you were trying to do at once and figure out which of those actually need to be done. Um, and, yeah, you see it through a different light. So that's helped. Um, talking about it's helped. So um, I have a different psychologist now. Um, and, you know, <laughs> my husband's like, how long do you think you need to keep doing psychology for? And I'm like, I'm going to go. For the rest of my life because this lady is amazing um i just think everyone in the world should have one you, you don't realize just how oh just to separate stuff and yes. um yeah we don't talk necessarily talk about stroke all the time we talk a lot about work and uncertainty around yeah. where that's gonna land and um but yeah i think that's really helped um exercise helped but it it didn't in the start. So now that I can do it, I'm getting those free endorphins um, I get back again, which is great because, you know, the first 12 months I wasn't able to use exercise um, as like a calming sort of technique. But, um, yeah, I did find online um, it was just about a two-minute recording and it was on YouTube and it was breathing exercises, a lady who talks you through breathing in holding for two seconds and then blowing out for six seconds um, while pretending like you're blowing out a candle. Yep. And she just talks you through it. It's not rocket science. And I'd put it on in my car if I was getting a bit ampy. Um, and that used to help as well. So yep. yoga great. I can't do. I can't tip my head over, sadly. So yoga, Pilates, that kind of thing, um, I'm not really able to get yeah. into. Yeah. Um, Amy, what, how is it for you to get, with people with similar conditions, they often get triggered going to the supermarket because mm -hmm. the busy lines, a lot of people, sure. the fluorescent lights, is it similar for you as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was only about a month ago, I had a bad experience in one of the supermarkets. Um, so I must have just been super, super tired. Yeah, I had to be there because I'm a mum and, well, like everybody, you need food in your house. So... Um, I only ever do small shops. I never go in and try and do like a huge shop because it's just too much. But um, yeah, I was in there and the lights or something had triggered me and then on came the fight or flight response and then down I went into the um, rabbit hole um, and I was like, I've got to get out of this shop because I'm starting to like get that wave of fear come over me. I'm like, I need to get out of here and I need to get out of here now. But I thought, I also really need this food. Um, and they say, you know, keep the self-talk up, even though I'm not sure that's that's never really worked for me. Um, but, yeah, I grabbed the food, the necessary food, and got out pretty quickly. But supermarkets are a nightmare. Um, shopping malls as well, like indoor shopping malls with all the shiny tiles um, on the floor. And there's a, there's some chemists here um i think you might like pharmacy or drug stores in yeah. america um we've got one in particular that that the aisles are really narrow and they tag all the prices on the shelves with these bright yellow tickets okay. so you walk down this narrow um aisle and all you see is yellow and shiny floor and, and fluorescent light so no. it's like it's the pathway i was thinking yesterday i was in there yesterday i'm like this is like the gauntlet of hell for yeah. a stroke survivor <laughs> like me or really. someone with vestibular conditions um so yeah it absolutely impacts me and the way i get through it is i just tell myself you have to get this it's going to take two minutes like look at the ground look wherever you need to look 
and just kind of I basically just head down bum up um and then get get out like just stay yeah. as the yeah. shorter time as possible Amy what how did this impact your relationships with friends and family because a lot of people don't understand the depth or the changes that a condition like this could have in your life for the rest of your life so mm -hmm. are people pretty uh empathetic and understand or they kind of like kind of like oh we miss the old you we miss the the amy that was always active and doing all these things like how, how has it been um pretty positive all around um i'm sure people do miss the old amy but they're also very grateful that i'm obviously here and yes. that i am am improving with time so um one of my best friends um has been the best support um and so patient and so understanding and just you know she suffered her own tragedy around the time of my stroke her mother passed away yeah. um and so we said to each other you know this is just our downtime like we used to be out and about all the time we had such a great run and then all of a sudden both of us at the same time came crashing down and um you know all through last year we were struggling and then we got to the end of last year and i was feeling well enough to be able to go to um like a bar around christmas time and I said, if we ever get to the point that we can go out together, like to bars and socialize in public again, if I ever get to that point, then when we do it, we are going to do it well. We are going to buy expensive champagne. We're going to have it in front of us. We're not going to drink fast. Yeah, we're going to do it in style. And then, so it was around, I don't know, December the 20th or something. We did it and we took photos and we were like, you know go back a year to where we were how miserable we both were and then we were sitting at this um this bar just just near home with this expensive bottle of french champagne nice. like we're not pretentious but we were just like we can do this like we've done it we've, we we thought this would never happen again so it's you know that's a good example of a big win but you know all throughout last year there were little wins as well so um you know she'd invite me out for dinner with with another friend and i'd say nah can't do it too loud too stimulating and yeah. she'd go yep no worries so there was never any oh, why don't you just try or yeah. i'm not i'm gonna stop asking because you always say no it's never really been like that um yeah. and i think if people are like that you're better off not seeing them um and just focus on the people that get it and want to get it and you know just because I'm going through this in my life. I'm not impacting on anyone else's life. Like it's, if people want to be your friend, they'll be your friend. They'll continue to be your friend. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes you a bit more selective, certainly. And, you know, I definitely make contact with the people I want to be friends with now. And I've got a whole new perspective, but that's another 45 minute talk. Um, but yeah, I think the people that ask questions and try and understand, they're the, they're the gems and they're the ones you need to keep in your life. Yeah. Amy, um, a lot of the people that watch the interviews are parents. Uh, a lot of them mm -hmm. are mothers, so like you are mom. And a lot of them, they message me and they said that they feel guilty because they feel like they can't parent anymore because they are exhausted all the time. They, they have these symptoms yeah. they, and they feel guilty that they might not be as present for their children. What would you like to tell them in order to make them feel that there is hope? Um, I feel this too. And, you know, I'm not sure of the answer because I often do feel this. And, you know, when I first came home from my stroke, I wasn't even sure if I could walk up the stairs in my house to kiss my daughter goodnight. And luckily I did. And I just forced it to happen while holding onto the wall. But, um, Mother's guilt is evil. And if you weren't feeling guilty about this, you would be feeling guilty about something else. So mother's guilt is always there, no matter what your circumstance. Um, and I guess it's how, how much you want to let it in and let it rule. So, you know, in the early days, um, when COVID hit Australia um, and the restrictions come in, came in, mm -hmm. um, we luckily were still able to 
sort of pack up your family and go to a national park or go to a walking trail. That was still all allowed. Um, Well, pretty much most of the time. Um, So what I would see online and on Facebook through my personal pages is all these families at the beach or walking along coastal trails or going out to explore um, like nature and hiking and doing all these things that no one would have ever done before. But because of COVID and this was really all you could do, People were doing it and people were shouting about it. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen unless it's on Facebook. It never happened. And people just felt the need to post their family being outdoors. So that really got to me because, you know, during COVID, um, I was doing my best to, um, you know, what do they call it? Homeschool. Um, But the downtime was downtime. and, And I, I had to lay down. And my kids had to watch movies and I was not taking them hiking and they were not looking at waterfalls and like that sucked. Um, And it still sucks because, you know, I want to take them out and I want to take them to adventure places and I want to go on water slides with them. But when you look at what the kids really want, um, they don't necessarily want that. They they want their mum with them. Um, You could be you know, looking at the biggest waterfall in the world, or you could be having a picnic with the teddy bears on your back lawn. Your children, um, your children want to be with you and they want your, they want you to be present with them. And I don't think it really matters like where you are, but yeah, it's something I'm working through and I work through all the time as well because I'm limited in what I can commit my kids to. Yeah. Uh, Amy, we're almost done. So uh, where can people find you if they like to ask some questions or they want to see and raise awareness like you do in, in social media? Yeah, sure. Um, I created a Instagram page last September um, to help share my story and to try and find people going through something similar just to give them hope. And um, I know I know the hope for me is looking at people ahead of me in the stroke recovery journey and seeing what they're doing. That, and that's what keeps me going. So um, if I can do that for other people, that's that's the um, motivation behind the account. So it's um, the at sign and then it's the AIMS, A-I-M-Z, recovery. And it's also on Facebook, but more so Instagram at this yes. point. Okay, awesome. What does the future hold for Amy? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Did you I was get that? What does, what does the future hold for you? I haven't got that worked out yet. Um, I just want to be functional, functional enough for my kids to be happy. And that's my number one priority now. If you had to ask me that same question 16 months ago, I would have said status, money, power. And those things don't even come into my top 10 now. So. For me, it's hand on heart. If I can be a mom and I can be functional enough for my kids to be happy, that's my number one goal. Anything I can then add on top of that um, is a bonus. So I'd love to get into public speaking and I'd love to share my story and try and connect with people that way and help them through like their challenges. Maybe, maybe even write a book. That. Maybe even get a book in the future. Maybe. Maybe. maybe my, last, my last question to you is, this channel is called Find Your Happiness. So find your happiness. How does sure. Amy find her happiness? Um, I think it. you have to know who you are and what your purpose is. So um, I've got techniques where I understand and I, you know, look inside myself and I go, what is most important to you right now? Um, and everything else just falls away. So I do what makes me happy and what makes me fulfilled on a daily basis. And sometimes the hardest bit is working out what that is, but there are ways and often you're doing it wrong. So old Amy was doing it completely wrong um, and I was not happy, but stroke has made me happy and it's also made me frustrated and angry and bitter, but <laughs> those, um. Those feelings are much less these days, but it's made me a happier, better person. And I guess it's perspective and purpose. So figure out, figure out your purpose, what you believe in, and let anything else just fall away from that. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Amy. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I know your episode is going to probably make a lot of impact, positive impact in, uh, in someone's life. So it's, uh, it's great, great being talking to you and enjoy that beautiful weather out there because it's, it's freezing cold in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will do. And thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Bye, Amy. Bye.